we're going to be talking about something very specific, and we're going to dive into the realm of estate planning and elder law. And I am no expert, but I am sitting with an expert in this realm. I'm sitting here with Jason E. Basher out of Amesbury, Massachusetts. You are an estate planning and elder law lawyer, or attorney, actually, Correct. I think it's a better term. I live with my mom right now, and that's kind of why we reached out to you, because we wanted to get our house in order, you know, all, the, all our ducks in a row. And it was a good thing we did because, and not to get into a lot of details, but when you have, or when a family finds an attorney or a person to handle this particular area of their life, documentation and all of the steps are crucial because when you mentioned to us when you were doing some of your research, we thought our house was in a trust. Correct. And it actually wasn't. It wasn't, no. And I, and that's kind of really what triggered me to want to do this podcast because we had no idea this whole it was years we thought that this was all set we didn't have to worry about anything and then we decided to just do some updating correct thankfully yep. and you found out that I think it was like the final step hadn't been done I think everything was done up to was it was it was the filing of the the trust I think it was right which is huge it, w it was placing the property into the trust placing the property okay. and in the past um, I've seen this often, and it's all depending on the attorney. Mm -hmm. There are some attorneys that will draft your will and your trust. Mm -hmm. and they'll, great, they'll draft this terrific trust, but yet they won't put anything in it, which completely defeats the whole purpose of doing right. the trust. And so I've noticed that a few times. My father had that same situation where he said to me, oh, yeah, the house is in a trust. And I looked because you can go right online to the Registry of Deeds website. Correct, yes. And I said, Dad, no, it's not. So that's scary. Yeah. So Very that scary. that same situation was in, in your family. You went over everything with us. We had our Zoom meetings. You were very. Um, what I liked about what you did too is you explained things to us, and you you right. put up with all of my post its and all of my notes because I'll tell you when I printed out the documents, which was a lot of yes. pages, we read those pages, and I I don't, I don't know how many post its they put. Let's ask him about this. That was a long meeting. <laughs> It was. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. I have one individual. She's 90, and she's very wealthy. Never did anything. Oh, and, of course, the problem is now is that, you know, we had to – she needed a power of attorney yep. because while you're alive, your most important documents is your power of attorney and your health care proxy. Those are your incapacity documents. Right. And big, her husband, of course, had passed many years ago, so her daughter needed to act as her power of attorney because she was incapacitated. Problem is, she didn't have a power of attorney in place, so her daughter had to retain me to to apply to get her be her conservator. Wow! So we had to do a conservatorship with the probate court, and it is a very long, expensive process where it easily could have been avoided by just having a simple power of attorney in place. Yes. So with a revocable trust, anything that's in that trust will avoid probate, which is key because you want to avoid probate as much as you can. Right. The irrevocable trust. That's a common document I do with my older clients. Now, with my practice, I just do estate planning and elder law. Like I said, I will do some probate. If it's a uh, current client of mine, I'll do it. With the irrevocable trust, it's a very common document. Like I said, for my older clients, I think I just said that. Yeah. Um, and that's for long-term care planning. Now, the elder law portion of my practice essentially is long-term care planning. I call it estate planning on steroids. That sounds about right. Right. Yeah. So it's basically enhancing, if you do have a plan in place, enhancing what you have. If you don't have a plan, then obviously creating a whole new plan, uh, creating a new one. But the irrevocable trust, what that does is it avoids long-term care issues. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't have a choice. Yeah. Where your, your loved ones can't care for you anymore, or if mm -hmm. there's nobody there to care for you anymore, sometimes you don't have a choice. Right. So then the question becomes up is, how are you going to pay for that? Exactly. Yeah. There's only two ways. it's not cheap. No. no by average, any means, it's so expensive. Average cost of Massachusetts is roughly around 13000 a month. Oh, my God. I was at a conference in Denver a few years back, right before COVID, for elder law attorneys. It's called uh, it a national group I'm part of called Elder Council. And I was the only Massachusetts attorney in there. And oh, really was, the only one? Only one. Out of the whole one. Oh, yeah, and there was, there was 50 attorneys all from around the country. And, of course, the, the presenter said, all right, they went around the room and say, what's the average cost of a nursing home in your state? And of course, somebody from Wyoming raises their hands, $5,000, oh, and gosh, Nebraska, $6,000. And of course, as you got east, um, it was going up and up and up. In Massachusetts, the third highest 
the country were right there, neck and neck, was New York and Connecticut. I'm just going to ask you who the other two were. But the two. Connecticut. New York and Connecticut, right up there, the same. Interesting. But Hawaii and Alaska. Oh. I didn't, I didn't know that either. But Hawaii and Alaska are one and two, right, as far really? as how long-term care costs. I find that very odd. But see, I'd love to land in Hawaii one day. I'm so not going I. there. So would I. Your trustee doesn't have to be a loved one, doesn't have to be a friend. It's just simply somebody you trust that knows it's going to follow your wishes to right. the letter of the law. Right. If you can't make your decisions on your own. So yeah. it doesn't have, like I said, it doesn't have to be a loved one or, mm -hmm. or a friend. Have you ever run into a situation where the trustee that someone picked turned out to maybe not be so honorable? I'm just, you know, curious if that's ever really, I mean, I'm sure it's happened. It happens. But. It happens. I haven't seen it very much. Oh, that's good. Um, but it does happen, unfortunately. Um, yeah. You know, nothing's perfect, but um, um, I haven't seen it very often, though. In my, in no, my that's practice. good. I would hate to know that it happens more often than not. I mean, right. that's very scary. I mean, I've had situations where now the trustee that they picked is now incapacitated themselves. Oh, what do you do in a situation? So like that's why I always that? recommend you name a backup in place. Okay. So always have a backup in place just in case. Um, if that primary person you've elected either predeceases you mm -hmm. or becomes incapacitated or they just simply don't want to do it. Oh, that's yeah. oh, okay. Yes, yeah, sometimes yeah. they just change their mind. Right. So it's like a plan B. Maybe we could do another episode down the road. Maybe we'll just do Love a fun to. fun one outside of the law and, and um, you know, maybe I'll bring some snacks. Yes. That'd be fantastic.